problems in Canada, but compared to most of the world, we are so privileged. And I always need to remind myself of the incredible benefits we have. You know, I've got uh, friends in the United States at conferences when I meet them and they tell me about their concerns about having health issues and how you could become bankrupt. Uh, someone was saying that to have a baby a few years ago was $6,000 alone, uh, just in, right. Uh, and of course, we're blessed with the healthcare system that we have and so many advantages to being part of this great nation. And so I give thanks. Um, although I, I do notice on occasion, the press seems to always focus on problems. Have you noticed that? Uh, there were about a million people out for the Raptors celebration. It was, it was absolutely huge. Some people in the congregation were there. Um, but what got the press? A shooting and a stabbing. So of the 999,000, 992 people who actually were able to have a great time together and celebrate something for our city, the eight people who were creating problems got the press and international coverage, by the way. And what a sad thing, but have you noticed how often that seems to be the case? You can see a problem, but it seems to dominate Maybe there's something in our Canadian psyche somewhere about uh, always fixating on problems instead of forgetting the blessings that we have. And so on this Canada Day, one of the things I like to do is thank God for the blessings we have. You know, I, I do go to places where you can be arrested for being a Christian. Uh, and worshiping freely is something you need to be very careful about. And we have the freedom of religion in Canada the freedom to gather, to worship, so much to give thanks for in, um, in our government and situation. So um, this Canada Day, I'll be celebrating that. Well, it's also on the theme of to this morning's sermon, which is about loving God and loving others and the things that get in the way of that. And I want to pick up on our reading from uh, Luke chapter 9. As you know, the Bible has four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four gospel writers are telling the story of the life of Jesus. They're writing from their perspective and experience uh, of Jesus' ministry or the people who are in contact with Jesus. They're also writing to different communities. And the different communities they write for affect the stories that they tell because they choose particular material that will make sense to the people they're writing to. So Luke's gospel, likely Luke was a physician. Many scholars believe this. There's good evidence for it. And Luke writes to both Gentiles and Jews. And therefore, in Luke's gospel, he'll explain a number of Jewish practices in a way that Matthew does not in his gospel. Matthew assumes his audience knows what the Sabbath is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you're a Gentile, uh, there would be a number of Jewish uh, uh, practices. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know uh, Hebrew, uh, or Aramaic, uh, for example. And so often the gospel writers will translate words that Jews would have likely known, but Gentiles would not. The other thing that Luke does is deliberately tell stories about non-Jews to get across the point that the gospel is not just for the Jewish people. They're the people through whom the blessing, the covenant made to Abraham is fulfilled, but the Gentiles are grafted into this blessing through faith in Christ. And so Luke in particular tells stories that speak of Jesus' ministry with non-Jews. And that's at the heart of this morning's reading about the Samaritans. So let me start with somebody I absolutely love, Jeffrey, uh, Godfrey Chaucer, one of the great English writers of the 14th century. And in his book, Canterbury Tales, he tells stories uh, it provides vignettes uh, that are so accurate of people in the 14th century. Most of these people would never leave the village or town in which they were born. You would grow up and die in the same place. By the way, that's the basis of bans of marriage. Uh, you can get a license from City Hall or you can get a bans of marriage. Bans of marriage, if you're coming from Jamaica, you may remember this. They would nail them to the church door. So if two people wanted to be married, You'd put it public notice, and so if the person already had six wives, word to get out. 
and the wedding wouldn't go forward. But the only reason they could do bands of marriage was that people knew each other in the community because they spent their whole lives living in the community. The exception to this were people who are sailors or uh, travelers uh, in business, a, few, a very small percentage, or pilgrims, people who went on pilgrimage on the Santiago, uh, the Camino in Spain, for example. We've been walking that for almost a thousand years. Um, and so people would go on pilgrimage. In Jesus' day, most people in Judea didn't travel very far. They stayed in their village. Their experience was their village. That was their life. The exception were uh, Jews coming from Galilee in the north because in between Galilee, uh, they had to come to Jerusalem to celebrate at the temple, Passover, the Festival of Weeks, which we know as Pentecost, and so on and so on. Uh, the great Jewish festivals. People would come down from the north. It's a three-day walk, and some of you have walked it with me from Nazareth to Capernaum, so you know what that journey's like. Around the Sea of Galilee, you can expect 36, 37 Celsius, and walking for three days back to, or up to Jerusalem. You ascend to Jerusalem. And um, so people would uh, do the pilgrimage, but the pilgrimage route, the straightest road was to go through Samaria right to Jerusalem. But most pilgrims actually from Galilee did this, to avoid going through Samaria. And Jesus, of course, tells the scandalous story of the parable of the good Samaritan. Most Orthodox Jews would say, there's no good Samaritans, they're all heterodox infidels, effectively. We hate them, they hate us, we want nothing to do with them. How can you tell the story of the good Samaritan? And so what's interesting is Jesus is coming down from, Jerus uh, from the north, Galilee, he's coming to Jerusalem. They're wanting to pass through Samaria preaching the gospel. Now the Samaritans, a little bit of backstory to this. When the northern kingdom fell, about 800 uh, BC, uh, people were taken into captivity. Eventually, the southern kingdom, or Judah, fell uh, in conquest to foreign conquerors, and they did what many nations do and still do today, by the way. China practices this in Tibet. They relocate their own people, who they trust, into the area you want to control, and in um, Jesus' day and also beforehand in uh, earlier times, they would take everybody who was educated, all the elites, move them to another part of the empire, discombobulate them. And then you would move people you trusted into that area. Now, they didn't get all the Jews. Uh, many of them were transported to Babylon, and you get that great psalm, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, and yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. How can we sing the Lord's name in a strange land? Because the temple was gone, place of worship was gone. How do you stay faithful and orthodox in a strange land? Your own language and culture and religion. Meanwhile, back in the area that they were transported out of, the new residents intermarried with the remaining Jews. And you've got two things happening. Uh, um, a dilution of the Jewish identity through intermarriage with other groups and a change in religious practice. So instead of, for example, worshiping at Mount Zion, uh, at the Temple Mount, you would worship at Mount Gerizim. And so the Samaritans developed their own heterodox Jewish traditions, quite separate from Orthodox Judaism. And for a whole variety of reasons down through history, those two groups really disliked each other. Like, they wouldn't even go into each other's villages. They would avoid each other as much as possible, which explains when Jesus sends people ahead to the village to say, I'm coming, get ready for me, they ask what question? Where are you, are, where are you going? If you're going to worship the temple in Jerusalem, don't bother coming here. If you're just coming here, that's okay. But if you're doing a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, we want nothing to do with you. That's what's going on. And that's why the disciples get so incensed and say, should we call down fire from heaven to incinerate these Samaritans? So they're having issues about hatred. 
of ethnic groups. That's what's going on. The other issue that's going on is the disciples themselves. So Jesus is, in one sense, in his journey from the mountain in an earlier chapter. He's coming down through Galilee to Jerusalem. He's doing, in one sense, an exodus, leading the people from bondage and slavery into freedom. As Moses received the commandments on the mount, came down the mountain, and then led the people into the promised land. Luke is doing a deliberate parallel here in telling this story with talking about Jesus coming down the mount, going to Jerusalem where the law and freedom is going to be fulfilled in his death on the cross. And, but there are going to be obstacles all along the way. People complaining, we want to go back to Egypt. This is really bad out here. We're starving to death. Why would you bring us out of the desert to die, et cetera, et cetera. And Jesus encounters all of these kind of interesting challenges on this journey to Jerusalem. One of the challenges is his own disciples. Now, have you ever gotten together for family gatherings and you've wanted to go, good grief, are we related? Because, because sometimes the behavior or practice can be different, quite unique. Parenting issues, all these kind of things, sibling rivalries. So we know, for example, just before Jesus comes into the Samaritan village, the disciples as they're walking along the road, they have these conversations, right? Do you know what they're talking about? They're not talking about, what is God going to do? Where is Jesus going to Jerusalem? What are they talking about? Which one of us is greatest? I call it selfieism. They're so interested in their own agenda, they can't see what God is doing in Jesus. And the only thing they're thinking about is, what's our status? You know, how many likes do I have on my Facebook account? I call this selfieism. I was, I, I, you know, you have these things seared into your memory. So a couple months ago, I'm sitting in a restaurant in Madrid. This particular restaurant is the third best restaurant out of 10,000 in the city of Madrid. It's absolutely amazing. Multi-course meal uh, paired with Spanish wines. It was just amazing. So I'm sitting there having my dinner. In walk four tourists. They're sitting at a table across from me. Both the staff and myself, because I could see the staff actually killing themselves laughing off to the side. Uh, These four individuals... And this was a multi-course meal. They kept bringing the courses. Every time the course came, they would take their camera and do what? Take a selfie. No, not take a picture of the food. Take a picture of themselves with the food. So it's always like this. Four of them in a row. And I, how many of you like to watch people? Aren't they fascinating? This was, you could have, I would have paid to be there for the entertainment. It was fascinating to watch these four people. Um, Here's the real kicker. They weren't eating the food. They were just taking pictures of themselves with the food. So going through the the thing progressed on, they, they did eventually eat something from dessert. But I thought to myself, all they can see is themselves. And all they want to project is themselves to their friends that they're in this great restaurant and so on. But they're really missing the point. What's the point? Eat the food. It's fantastic. Enjoy the service. The, 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 the service was just fantastic. You, you have these memories. So that, as I finished my meal at night, I was killing myself laughing about this particular incident. But the disciples, in a sense, are selfieism. You know, if they had little cameras there, they could be taking pictures of themselves walking down the road. Which one of us is greatest? And missing the point. And what Jesus is trying to say, and Luke is getting across to the the Christians in the gospel, and it's picked up in Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia, our first reading, is that love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Don't do the selfie thing where all you ever see is your own agenda because you miss the kingdom of God. You can never pick up your cross if all you're doing is looking at yourself. 
And in fact, the greatest challenge of the gospel, I think, is in picking up the cross, it is to die to yourself, to put my own agenda aside and listen for the voice of God. Where is God calling me to go? Where is God calling me to love? And it is in the small things, those daily attitudes about parking or passing lanes. Uh, If my daughter were here this morning, she would be able to tell you about some of my comments as people cut me off on the highway. (laughs) It's, no, you could ask her. I'd like to say, I say, bless you. (laughs) Uh, No, I actually use Greek uh, to to (laughs) describe, I do, to to use, uh, to describe some of the driving I actually see. But I'm, I'm reminded of how I need to actually die to myself in order that Christ can be more present and that people see Jesus in my life. And it's in those daily interactions. It's in those moments with your family when you lose patience. In those Canada Day barbecues where your family are together and all those sibling rivalries that were never solved when you were growing up are still there. It's in how you take attentiveness to, you know, I see it with uh, people at checkout counters or on cruise ships, or waitresses, and so on. Uh, Other people are just sometimes really brutal in how they treat people. And isn't it nice to go up and say, you know, thank you, I really appreciate your help today. Thank you for doing that. Or, you know, I appreciate your smile, thank you. But a word of encouragement, the little things that bring love, and in one sense, die to our own agenda in order that Christ can be present. What's the biggest witness to someone else about the love and reality of God? How you love others. How will they know you are Christians? By your love. What a challenging thing. Now, in a couple of weeks, I'll be in Calcutta with the mission team and we'll be working in Mother Teresa's uh, homes in Calcutta. Uh, People have an opportunity to work with uh, children who have been abandoned, who have severe physical and mental challenges, uh, with people who have leprosy, uh, with the dying and the destitute. We'll have a chance to volunteer. And one of the places we'll we'll go to on our first day is actually the tomb of Mother Teresa, which is in the mother house. It's in a a small room with gray, simple benches around a raised concrete uh, tomb in the center of Uh, indoors in this room. And as you sit there, you meditate on the life and example of Mother Teresa. Now, I've been reading a book, which is really her spiritual biography. Uh, When it was produced, it was absolutely shocking because people were shocked that Mother Teresa felt she was far off from God. And she went through profound periods of spiritual dryness. There was one characteristic of her ministry which was absolutely profound. Jesus says, in order to follow me, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me. Her life is this journey about learning how to pick up her cross, to diminish her own ego, and to love other people without reservation. You know, if at the end of our days, people say that about each of us, They may not have had much money, but boy, did they love other people. What a tribute at the end of your days to be known as a person who loved God and loved others. So here's a story from Mother Teresa. She's struggling with how to leave behind herself and put God first, how to pick up her cross and died to her own ambition. And she writes this in in an early experience. Every Sunday, I visit the poor in Calcutta slums. I cannot help them because I do not have anything, but I go to give them joy. Last time, about 20 little ones were eagerly expecting their ma. When they saw me, they ran to meet me, even skipping on one foot. I entered In that para, which is how a group of houses is called there, 12 families are living. Every family has only one room, two meters long, and one and a half meters wide. 
The door is so narrow that I could hardly enter. Mother Trace is this tall. The door is so narrow I could hardly enter and the ceiling is so low I could not stand upright. Now, I do not wonder that my poor little ones love their school so much and that so many of them suffer from tuberculosis. The poor mother of the family she visited did not even utter a word of complaint about her poverty. It was very painful for me, but at the same time, I was very happy when I saw that they were happy because I visit them. Finally, the mother said to me, Oh, Ma, come again. Your smile brought sun into this house. May we be people who bring the sun, S-O-N and S-U-N, of God's love into the lives of other people.